Um, if you were just on the German one, you noticed we also moved rooms. <laughs> just to keep things interesting, you know. We stop live stream, short captions. Yeah, and then enable chat. Speaking All language in English sounds good. What? What is it? I said we want to shape the language. Which which? We have a ball of hands to do. It's showing me the freedom. Okay. That's so good. So I'd rather see what it is. And I to hold on a second. So no. so now. Okay, now. Okay. It's, it's, it seems like they changed things. They do. They do. They do. They do change things. It's not in the same place. Okay, okay. So one thing real quick. Let me grab this link. Um, the later for me, I have to find my thing. We, there we go. So, hi, Marjorie from Edmonton. I, my hand, I'm about to. So, the doors are open for our Timing of the Aints course. We start on Friday. Here's the link. Please go check it out. We're going to be talking about some topics related to that today. Mm -hmm. If you like this topic, you want to know more about this topic, if you're realizing that this is really the, the, the stuff, the glue that binds, that holds everything that you're doing together, it really is. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you want more of that, and especially you want to work on training yourself better so that you can train your horse better, then come on in. We'd love to have you. Just check it out. It's a super great course. Mm -hmm. Super, super great. I mean, I mean, this is bad. What did I say? I mean, you are mad. Like, it's really super fun. You know, so I wouldn't say that, I guess. But it, it's really a course that complements mm -hmm. anything you do. And it can be taken by writers at any level. And it can be written with horses at any level. You can write it with a green horse can't do every single thing, but you can implement all the things, all the things, all the lessons. Um, you can ride it with an older horse. You can ride it with a rehab horse. You can ride it with a gated horse, uh, a horse that's new to dressage or, mm. or anything in between. Yeah, with any discipline horse. too. Yeah, any discipline. Yeah, because physics is physics, right? Yeah. Um, it's biomechanics. Yeah. So that, that's why I mean it could be beneficial for a Western rider as much as for a jumper or a dressage rider. Absolutely. Like any anybody really. You know, it's really about fine-tuning your aids so that you can improve your communication with your horse. This goes for your forward driving aids, your stopping and slowing down aids, slow that all um, your bending aids, turning aids, sidestepping aids. Mm -hmm. What am I missing? Pause. Bring back aids, and we also go bending. into oh, bending. I think I said that. Mm -hmm. I think so. Bending, turning, sidestepping. Yeah, and then how to combine these into new and interesting ways that will really create an extra special influence on your horse or with your horse. Yeah. 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 So, hi, Leslie from the UK. Hi, Sally from the UK. Wonderful. Yeah. So we are here to talk about, ah, what are we talking about today? Influencing your horse's movement with your aids. You just had a good talk in the German one. It's a, yeah, it's a big topic and it's, it's an interesting one. Um, I, over the years, I have come to visualize the gaze or the movement of the horse like a 3D kind of entity, like a stream of energy or stream of water that you, is very dynamic, very mobile, and you can direct it, you can channel it up, down, left, right, forward, backward, and, and so on, right? 
and uh, so you're you're shaping that stream of energy and the horse with your seat and your aids, right? So you have a leg and a rein on each side, and they are a little bit like boundaries for that energy, like the banks of a canal or or a river, for example. Um, and it helps to think of the horse's body in terms of uh, having four corners. It's like a rectangle, right? The support base of the horse is, is a rectangle. It has four corners. At each corner, there's a leg. For each leg, you have a certain aid that is sort of responsible, right? For the front legs, you can use your knee and rein on, on the side and give a little nudge, a little impulse, and then that front leg will move over away from the nudge. And on the other side, you may have to make a little room. So, so you have this combination of creating space on one side and then sending an impulse from the other side. So the horse will move away from that energy impulse and into the open space, right? And then the shoulder turns, for example. You can do, and the, the pelvis may have to turn a little as you do it too. Um, with the hind legs, you can do the same thing. You could bring your hip and leg on one side back, give a little nudge with the lower leg. And on the other side, you could open your leg a little bit so that the horse will move the croup away from the lower leg that asks, you know, gives the impulse. And it moves into the space, you know, on the side where you're lighting up a little bit with your with your leg. leg. Um, so, I, you know, you can picture your legs and reins, knees, thighs, lower leg, you know, forearm, hand, rein, as these um, left and right boundaries so that the ship is a little bit, uh, the horse is like a ship in a canal, essentially, right? And you can direct the, the shoulders and the hips. You can direct these four corners of the body of the horse by turning yourself and then using your knee, rein, lower leg, and so on to, to guide the shoulders and, and the hind legs. Um, there, in, in some ways, it's a little bit like you know when when kids play with a with a creek. I mean, I used to love that as a kid. I used to thought that was the huge fun, right? You have a little creek of water somewhere, and then you dig on the side, and then the water flows, and you can redirect the water and, and flood some lower lower ground next to it. Then you put some rocks in it, and then the water has to flow around them or it, it, the water table rises if you put enough rocks in there and I thought that was super interesting and, and super fun and I still think it's fun <laughs> to play with that and <clears throat> with a horse it's kind of the same way right you can close a door and then the horse's energy can th flow through the door so it has to find a different way you can open a door and the horse's energy will find that opening will go through it right so you can redirect the energy by opening and closing doors or making a space sending a little impulse and the horse becomes very malleable that, that way right and it's this 3d kind of thing you know entity that you're accompanying and shaping and moving and so on and just like there's a, a left and a right kind of boundary there is a lower and an upper boundary. Lower boundary would be the ground, and the upper boundary is crowned by your your seat, you know, torso, pelvis, and so on. So now, with your seat, with your pelvis, you could be neutral and just follow the movement of the the horse's back. The back moves sort of like a wave, and you could be like a surfer or like a boat, you know that just mm, swims on top of the wave, you know, and, and uh, rides that, that wave. But you could also emphasize the upward motion, create a little space under your seat to see if the horse's back will come up and fill it. Or you could send an impulse down, emphasize the downward motion of the wave, and press the hind leg into the ground, right? And then that situation the horse is a little bit like a like a basketball if you you can bounce or dribble a basketball send an 
energy impulse through the ball into the ground and then um, the ground will be a resistance and then the ball compresses and this force you're sending down through the ball into the ground creates this equal and opposite force according to Isaac Newton, right? And that makes the ball bounce up. And if you do it just right in the same intensity, uh, the, the right intensity, the right rhythm, timing, timing the, the ball will bounce a little higher every time. And you can do this with a horse. Like if you have a horse that's slightly on the um, lazy side, you can create energy and impulsion by sending, you know, your weight through the hind leg into the ground, compressing the hind leg and allowing it to rebound. If you do it just right, your your ball will bounce a little higher every every stride, every time. And the horse suddenly develops energy, power, impulsion, much more so than if you drive the horse through with your leg. You know, that's always sort of the, especially in German dressage, the, ride forward, drive them through, you know, so people try to think they have to use a lot of leg and, you know, often that makes the horses stiffer and less willing to go forward, whereas this really um, deliberate pressing down, letting go, um, creates much more of a desire to go forward and to extend the joints of the hind legs and to push, right? Um, so maybe a weird thought, if you've never heard this concept, if you, you've only been taught by people who tell you more leg, more leg, right, more forward, you know, but um, if the hind legs are extended and they're already more or less in pushing mode, um, but maybe, you know, I don't know, with it not enough energy, then driving with your lower leg is probably not going to do a whole lot, but uh, um sitting on the hind leg, flexing the hind leg, releasing the hind leg, that can build energy. And it's like this basketball that you start with a very small bounce, small dribble, and then it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And then, um, you know, the horse wants to go forward and you you have a lot of energy all of a sudden. So that's sort of an idea of the horse's motion that's, developed for me over the last 20 years or so, probably. Um, it's not as technical mechanical as I started out or as a lot of people teach, but it's really more about this shaping of the, the energy. And uh, so there are moments when you're passive, neutral, you're flowing along with the horse. And then there are moments where you become active by and accentuating aspects of that movement. You can also swing a little bit more right or left with your pelvis and take the rib cage out to create more bend or to shift the weight into the outside pair of legs. Or you could do the opposite. You could swing to the inside and put the weight more into the inside hind leg. Um, that, yeah, that sort of thing. One thing that's important to keep in mind is that um, nothing is ever really static. You know, because the horse is dynamic, the horse's gait is dynamic, you want to increase the gaits of the horse usually. Um, and the traditional riding instruction that comes from the military tried to keep everything as simple as possible because the officers didn't really think that their um, simple soldiers were capable of thought, you know, or differentiation. So everything had to be very simple, always sit on the inside seat bone, always have the inside leg at the girth, always have the outside leg behind the girth, uh, and always this, never that, and so on. And also the seat triangle, sit on your seat bones and on your fourth leg. And then that's that's it, basically. It's like all the time, you always have the weight in the same place, nothing ever changes. But that creates rigidity, right? And if you're always on the inside seat bone or always with your weight on your seat bones and your fork, then your seat becomes dead, right? If you have a dead seat, the horse will have a dead back. 
just like when you have a dead hand because it's rigid and just holding, then the horse will develop a dead mouth, a dead rein contact, right? <clears throat> so in reality, everything is dynamic. Everything is always in motion. You're always surfing the wave of the horse's back, and then you're trying to direct and redirect and shape the wave. You can make it bigger, and you, if you make that wave taller, it becomes shorter in a sense. It's like a ballistic curve, right? If you think of a ballistic curve, the, tall, the taller the curve, the shorter it will be. So um, if you shoot an arrow or throw a ball straight up, it will come straight down. It won't go very far. If you direct the pushing power of the horse's hind leg straight up, then the hind leg will come straight down. So then you will yeah, basically have a PF. <clears throat> if the horse's legs just go up and down without going forward much, if you send the energy up at a 45 degree angle, you get maximum reach, right? For the medium trot, extended trot, you don't send the energy straight up, you send it up at 45 degrees and then you get the longest possible striding. If the takeoff angle is less than 45 degrees, the stride length becomes shorter and the horse will fall on the forehand, <laughs> right? So, and you'll feel that, you know, then the horse crashes onto the forehand and gets, gets heavy. So that's something to keep in mind. You know, the pushing power of the hind legs, you always flex the hind leg, you let the hind leg extend. In which direction does it extend? Straight up, you know, at an angle, or if it's horizontal, totally flat, then the strides will be short but quick, and the horse will be sort of rushy and on the forehand. Right? So that's something to, to think about. You can change the vector of your pushing power more up, more, you know, flatter towards the 45 degrees. But uh, I guess it should be somewhere between 45 and, and 90. And if it gets below the 45 degrees, then the horse will, you know, fall on the forehand. And yeah, sometimes that's where you start. Right? With a green horse or with a correction horse, they can't go more uphill yet because they don't have the strength of the hind legs or the um, flexibility of the hind legs. But that's what you have to develop. You start where they are and then you try to create a different vector, you know, of the uh, pushing power of the hind. And so you go eventually go more uphill. Um, Yeah, so in, in terms of the seat, um, somebody in the German group was asking me yeah, that I always <clears throat> mention how in order to collect the horse, you have to kind of lighten the seat and allow the horse's back to come up. And she had always heard that you need to sit down and make yourself heavy. <clears throat> and um, a lot of people really think that if you want to collect, you have to sit really heavily on your seat bones. But what can happen when you do that is that um, the hind legs can't support that that much weight, and then they go out behind, the croup goes up, and then the back drops, and then you break the horse into two pieces, and the pole comes up and back towards you, the other leg come, comes out. Um, so in order to collect the horse, of course, first you have to bring the hind legs underneath you. And then you, you can send your way through the hind leg into the ground like you're dribbling a basketball, right? But of course, if you press the basketball into the ground permanently, it won't bounce, you know? It will, it will stay. And if you do the same with the hind leg, if you press it down and you keep it down, the hind leg will stop. And some horses will then get very crampy, you know, then they might go um, very stiff-legged, hind legs out behind, front legs out in front. That's often on the side effect of that, that the front legs will, as you see the PF sometimes, that people try to over collect the horse and sit really heavily and then the, the back kind of drops and breaks, you know, and into two pieces and the hind legs out, the front legs out in front, head up, under neck out, horse above the bit. And very unhealthy, very uncomfortable, you know, and doesn't feel good to the rider either. And if you, if you look at good PF pictures and videos, you see that a lot of these riders sit in a bit of a fork seat. They actually take the weight off of the back so that that can lift. Because when you want the hind legs to engage and, you know, and move, 
um, the belly muscles engage, they will contract, they pull the hind leg forward. And the more the uh, belly muscles contract and pull the hind leg forward, the more the back has to lift up, right? And your pelvis has to allow it. If your pelvis forms a ceiling, a low ceiling, the horse's back will try to lift. It will bump into the ceiling and will be reflected down. And then typically the hind legs go out, the croup goes up, and the back forms mm -hmm. in. Right? And you're sitting in a hole, which is a horrible feeling um, for the rider, but also for the horse, I would think. Right? So create space. It's, it's again, it always comes back to this main room and then send an energy impulse out, you know, so the horse's movement can fill that space. But if you send the impulse and you're not making necess the necessary room, where's the horse going to go, right? So there's always two sides of the, of the coin. On the one hand, we tell the horse what to do, right? With our active aids, we give an order, so to speak. We expect the horse to carry out the order. But do we allow the horse to carry out the order? Do we get out of the way? Do we make room so the horse can go where we want him to go? Or are we blocking at the same time? And of course, if we, we block, then the horse has to ignore our active aid or he has to oppose it. And then riders get frustrated, riders get angry, riders think horses are being mean and rude and disrespectful. And then they escalate, right? And then they get forceful. Um, whereas in reality, they were in the horse's way. They were not allowing the horse to do his job, right? So that's why when <clears throat> you give an aid and uh, the horse doesn't do what you want him to do or the horse resists, you always have to kind of check first, am I allowing the horse to do what I want? Am I making the necessary space for him to, you know, like if I send the impulse and say, yield to this impulse, go over there, or is there room over there where I want him to go? Or same thing with um, you know, lateral movements, for example, right? Your leg tells the horse go sideways, but your body weight also has to be, tell the horse, let's go over here. Because if your body weight tells the horse to go left and the leg tells the horse to go right, there's a conflict, right? And then the horse may not understand what do you want, right? It's like, I have two bosses here. One boss says go right, one boss says go left. Which one is it? Who's, who is the higher boss, right? And uh, the weight aid is the most intuitive, most immediate aid. Um, it's just sheer physics, right? That any horse will, will understand. Leg and rein aids are acquired aids. The horse has to learn what a leg aid means and what a rein aid means. So if there's a contradiction between leg and weight, the horse will probably decide to ignore the leg because it makes no sense and it will go with the weight because that makes sense. So if you try to go sideways and you feel like, man, I have to squeeze and drive with my leg, and the horse takes so much leg, then you have to kind of stop for a second and think, where's my weight? What is my seat telling the horse? Mm -hmm. You know, where's my seat and my weight sending the horse? Is that maybe sending the horse in the opposite direction of the leg? No wonder that there is resistance. So then stop, take the foot off the brake before you step on the gas, right? So um, make sure that your aids speak the same language. Make sure that all the aids tell the horse to go in the same direction and not, you know, different directions. Um, happens all the time, right? It sounds illogical when you say it like that, but it actually happens all the time, right? That there's a contradiction and often we're not even aware yeah. that we're contradicting ourselves or that we're blocking the horse from moving the way we want to. Yeah, most riders are not even aware that this is possible, yeah. <laughs> that this is even a thing. That's why we do Marjorie says we were lucky enough to have a queen to play in and build in. Thank you for the memory. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, that's nice. That's nice. I didn't have a queen to play in, but I used to flood my current yard and dig, dig. <laughs> <laughs> and dig in there. <laughs> I'm sure your parents were happy. They were not happy. <laughs> <laughs> they destroyed the lawn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
I wish we had a tree for our property. It's too bright, you know. For the tree. Yeah. Okay. Off topic. Yeah. As always. Yeah. But yeah, Sally. But he says it was a revelation when I first heard from you about lighting the seed to allow room for the horses back to come up. Yeah. Yeah. It took me many, many years to to realize that, and uh, yeah, I didn't realize that that was a possibility, or that was correct, or that you know was beneficial. But it's really a game changer once you realize that. When you make space, the horse's back comes up. Of course, the horse's back only comes up if there's enough energy and enough power. So sometimes you need to lighten the seat and activate the hind leg with your leg or the tickle of the whip so that the back comes up. But it's it's amazing sometimes how the horse goes poof. And then he's like twice the size in his rib cage and his back, you know, when he was before. So like you powerful. create the opening, and then you shoot out the door. You yeah. know, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's it's very yeah. powerful. Yeah. And then yeah, if you make room, you realize that if I allow my horse to to move, you know, if I give him a space to move into, suddenly I don't have to drive anymore. I hardly need any leg aids because my horse just you know wants to move and he fills the space that I made. Um, so that that's a, an important aspect in, in fine writing in a in a way, right? You, the less you contradict yourself, the more you enable the horse to to move, you know, the way you want him to. The more you make the necessary space for him to move into, the less you have to make him move. The less you have to drive or nag or kick or you know whatever. So. Um, if you explore that concept, you'll realize that you can get away with a lot smaller aids. Um, the more they, they all work together, the more you know, they cooperate with, with each other. Hmm. Sure the the Q&A says, is that bounce aid with your lower leg or with your upper leg? So I didn't catch that. Um, the, the basketball bouncing, that's a weight aid that can be sinking down with your seat and your pelvis. You can be yeah, stepping so into a stir. There could be a squeezing on the rain. So it's not a leg aid. It's yeah. a it's a weight aid. It's a weight aid, and uh, I mean, it really rain aids are weight aids. We're borrowing the weight of the head and neck and using them as leverage. Mm -hmm. Also, seat aids, stirrup stepping aids. These are all weight aids as well. I do it a lot in the in the truck with mm -hmm. my pelvis mm -hmm. by changing how much I go up and down. Like you can cruise along, neutral, passive, not doing anything. Yeah, you know, just literally like you're surfing a wave, right? But then you can swing up a little bit more, create space and see if the horse's back will follow you. Mm -hmm. And then you can emphasize the downward motion. So you sink a little more, you send your body weight through the hind leg into the ground, but then let the hind leg rebound and make space again afterwards. So the more you press down, the higher the hind leg will should lift and the more the back should lift up afterwards. So it's this very dynamic, neutral, lift, lift, push down, or first push down, then lift up, and then back to neutral. And you, you can explore that, right? You can go between sitting and rising trot, and you can go, um, you know, if, if you think of sitting and rising as um, like a sort of polar opposition or like a like a, a range, so to speak. And the sitting trot is at the lower end of the range, the rising trot at the upper end of that range of motion. Explore everything in between. Think of posting you know, rising to the trot, but only rise half of the full normal rising trot, or a quarter or an eighth. And then so the distinction between rising and sitting becomes blurred a little bit because you only go up an eighth or a quarter or half of the normal rising but amplitude and then you know anything in between anything goes you know it all has an Im impact on the horse you can even invite a hind leg to engage and step under more actively mm -hmm. if you in kind of um hint at posting within the sitting trot. So you pick a hind leg and you almost mini post 
within your sitting trot, and it almost can suck that hind leg mm -hmm. under a little bit more, especially if you combine it with a little bit of a driving aid at the same time, then you're giving the impulse with the leg, mm -hmm. and your seat is really going to go and sucking that hind leg under. Mm -hmm. It creates this little bit more, you can invite that hind leg under a little bit more. It can be really helpful with horses who can be a little touchy, you know, it's going to be really good. Mm -hmm. Good for horses with weak backs, yeah. creating room above the back. Mm -hmm. And if you consistently make room, and then if the horse doesn't fill it, you drive or drive with your leg and swing up and lighten the seat, then the horse will connect the dots at some point. And then you'll there'll come a moment where you just lighten the seat and swing up, and the horse activates the hind legs as mm -hmm. if you had applied a driving aid, but you didn't. Uh, so the horse self drives, so to speak, just as a his response to your swinging up and making room, mm -hmm. you know. So then uh, you're driving without driving, you know, no driving leg aid, but the horse acts as if you had a leg, yeah, aid, which is yeah. nice. Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. step towards fine riding, right? Absolutely. Everybody always talks about fine riding, right? But it's not often not explained how. So, yeah. but there are strategies, there are ways in which you can. That's what we're trying to do. We're yeah. trying to help you with this. Mm -hmm. Get you get you the tools that you need to get there. Mm -hmm. Oh, Karen, this is cool. Love, maybe love, 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 she that was on Facebook. Yes. Lots of hellos and on Facebook. Hello, everyone. Mm -hmm. Let's check YouTube. Uh, some hellos. More hello. Um, but no questions. Yep. So if you have questions with me of this, or you just want to comment on some of it, jump right in. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. says, yes, it was new to me too. It works, so doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it, it does. It's funny. It's, you know, it's physics in a way, right? It's, it has a certain logic to it, body logic. Yeah. And uh, yeah, this this three idea of this 3D stream of like water or energy it took me a very, very long time. To get that idea, but then it, it took over and it just evolved more and more. And, and uh, that's how I think of shaping the gate. That's how you can make the gate bigger. So you can take a horse with mediocre gates and you can make them bigger and nicer and more expressive with these ideas, with these concepts. Right? Um, and you can use it for straightening the horse because you're you know you're channeling the energy. Also, you know, if you think of these four corners of the horse's body and, and like a knee and a rein being responsible for a shoulder or the lower leg being responsible for a hind leg, and think of the ship in the canal and that ship gets out of alignment and bumps into one wall of the canal, maybe with his shoulder. If your knee and rein are in the right place at the right time, the horse will bump into them and then self-correct, or you'll close your fingers and give a little impulse with your knee and send that shoulder right back into the middle where it belongs. Or same thing with the hind leg. If the croup goes sideways, your leg is there, the horse bumps into your lower leg and you can send him back into the middle. And sometimes it's a little bit like a, um, swinging of a pendulum, like the horse might bump into your leg and then it Group swings the other way, swings a little beyond the middle, a little too far to the other side, and the other leg has to be there. Catch it and say, no, no, stay, you know, stay in the middle. And so the, you may have two or three movements of this pendulum, and hopefully every swing of the pendulum will be a little smaller until it stays in its lane, kind of, you know, and then you can go back to cruising. <laughs> so, um, yeah. John Hummel says, are you saying blind? Blind could not decide because he said upwards. 
Uh, I didn't say blind writing. I don't know what uh, the refers to. Um, sorry. Okay, apparently Tracy Arnell on YouTube asked what to do if your horse is very bored anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, she's asking if horse is very bored, how do you avoid hanging the horns? Mm, good question. Yeah. Good question. I think a lot of those. Um, yeah, if you if the horse is a little rushy, right, then and, and you try to half hold with the reins, they will tighten the back and drop, and they will invert and they'll run even more, right? These horses are not well connected to the ground with their feet. And what usually works really well is to use stirrup stepping. Horses usually don't fight stirrup stepping or they don't object to stirrup stepping because it's not a pressure you apply to the horse from the outside, but it comes from the inside and you're just holding certain feet on the ground for a little bit longer. Um, and you can move around the horse, you can talk to all four feet, you can talk to the diagonal pair, and uh, you can slow the tempo down with stirrup stepping. You can also, in the rising trot, stay in the saddle a split second longer rather than allowing the horse to catapult you right out of the saddle as soon as you hit the saddle. Stay down a moment longer, a split second longer, and stirrup step. And <clears throat> when you apply the stirrup pressure, you can add one of the reins. And the funny thing is that the horse will accept the rein aid often a lot better when it comes together with a stirrup aid. And the stirrup aid is like the dominant aid. And the rein aid is a little bit like an add-on on top of that. And the, but the horse will feel that stirrup pressure a lot more somehow than the rein aid. Or will, in his mind, the stirrup aid is a weight aid that plays a bigger role. And then they accept the, the rain aids a lot more. Um, and then, of course, if the horse is very rushy, right, lots of turns, lots of voltages, certain teams and figure eights. So, you know, the smaller the turn, the, the slower the horse has to go. Right? Um, whereas if you just go on a straight line, the horse can gather speed and drop the back and run off and so on. So I would probably use a combination of turning, you know, and then stirrup stepping and then trying to add um, rain, you know, rain pressure, rain aids to, to stirrup stepping. Um, and then you can, you know, get the horse to slow down the rhythm enough or go to the walk. And at the walk, you can also regulate with your pelvis, move your pelvis slowly. Don't let the horse move your pelvis quickly, but you insist on moving your pelvis slowly. And then, the horse will um, adapt to you, basically, it will mimic you. And then you can do a slow motion walk. And from there, you can prepare the trot, trot on and try to keep kind of this slow feeling in, in the trot through your seat, through the stirrup and you know, stirrup pressures and so on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is right off the topic, but if no questions, how do you teach a horse to tie? No problem if you don't want to get into this. We do have other questions, but we can yeah. answer them. Do you want horses, but very loose? We do it with young horses. Uh, babies, if we have them as babies, well, not little, little babies, but mm -hmm. when they're young. And um, tie them loosely so loose that we can quickly release it and you're nearby. First, basically, they need to learn how to, they need to respect you really well with lead. This is a prerequisite to tie. And because if they're pulling on you, dragging you, they're not respecting you when you're leading, they're not going to, they're going to get into trouble with tie. So first they need to have that in place and then we start by loosely tying them and basically so that we can do a quick release knot you know so that we can quickly release them if we need to actually if they're really nervous sometimes i just wrap the, the lead rope around something initially and kind of hold on to it so i can i'm very i'm holding on to it i'm very in command of the situation mm -hmm. and as they settle down they'll come up against it they need to come up against it and realize that they this is a limit mm -hmm. and 
but you want to be able to release it if they can. So it's just incrementally, and then as they get used to that, then I will tie it, but with a, a quick release, and then, but I don't walk out of the, for example, we usually do this in a stall, usually, in the, in a box stall, so, you know, the horse is tied to the front of the stall, but I won't leave the stall, I'll be in there grooming the horse and doing things with the horse, so they get used to that. When they're really stable with this, I start to leave for little periods of time, like to go to the tap room to go grab something, that sort of thing. But I'm nearby, so if there's trouble, I can quickly come back in and release the horse. Mm -hmm. and, and so incrementally building the amount of time. Mm -hmm. And then eventually when the horse can tie a single in a stall, then you can tie them outside. You can also cross tie. We like to, I like to bring on cross ties because it's easier to get to each side of the horse as well. It's just for my convenience. And but first they have to tie a single before I teach them to cross tie. And I repeat the same process with the cross ties. I usually have one attached and the other one loosely has like a, a lead rope attached to their halter and then run through and then I hold on to it. So I can release them if they panic. That sort of thing. And eventually they get to where they understand this. That's my process. I've never had to deal with horses that are really, really bad about breaking away. I mean, I did many years ago, and that horse I just ended up not being in time because the horse was really, he had panicked, he had flipped over a few times. It was very bad, but that was many years ago. I don't know that I would do it the same way now. You know, I'm more experienced now. I was in my 20s then, you know, so <laughs> it's very different now. Um, it's just incrementally building the understanding of the horse and making sure you prevent accidents from happening early. Mm -hmm. That that's huge. Avoid that's huge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you, you be there to reassure the horse, be there to release mm -hmm. when the horse breaks out, has to break out of the cross eyes or the break, you know, breaks the halter or the lead rope in panic. Now you have a horse with a problem. Mm -hmm. And the horse will always distrust being tied. Even if the horse can be safely tied in the future, that's always a little bit lurking there. Yeah, that's why it's good to you know, tie the horse in such a way that if he gets a little scared and pulls back, you yeah. can release that he doesn't feel like he's trapped or so. Yeah. Because then, yeah, when when the when you can release, then they, they will calm down and then you can gradually increase the resistance, maybe bring them closer. Bring them back, the, show them it's okay. Yeah. So they just have to have the feeling that if they really want to leave, they can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then so that they're not trapped and stuck, and then you know that's what, what makes them panic. Yeah. Some of them. Yeah. But yeah, if they at least have the illusion that they could leave if they wanted to, you know, that you can gradually leave them tie and they won't challenge it anymore. They, they might test in the beginning, you know, and then see. And that's okay. And yeah. when you want them to test it so they understand that's a boundary. You just want to be there when they do it so that if their testing goes too far or they get scared in the process, you can release it and go back. It's always at a point where they get scared or worried or something, it's always a sign to go back a couple steps and repeat, repeat and make it to the solid before moving on to the next step. Same thing with starting a course under saddle. It's the same sort of method. We're just doing different things. Oh, no, we have a lot of questions catching you guys. <laughs> They're holding out on their questions. Did you tell pieces any advice for someone who's <laughs> like at the point of struggling to feel which hoof is where and when? That's module one of the timing of the AIDS course. We'll go into detail. Heather. <laughs> how you, the Heather is just copying and pasting. Like oh, Julie, oh, Julie. Sorry, Julie Kelvin. Well, she's in, is she in that course? She might oh. But yeah, it's module one of the TOTA course. Um, TOTA is what we call it. Timing of the A's. Or yeah. short, it's called, yeah, timing of the A's. Yeah, well, we're explaining how you feel, which leg is where. There are telltale signs that tell you whether yeah. a leg is up or down. And take the time, even though it feels maybe boring at first, take the time to really observe. Number one, always learn to observe. The more you learn to be able to pay attention to the more data you have to work with. So number one, observe, learn to observe. Mm -hmm. And yeah, in the course we teach you what to look for, 
what to feel for, how to feel it, the different ways it can feel. It can feel different to different people. Different people explain it differently. <laughs> and also, it can feel different on different horses. You know, um, a horse with big movement is going to feel very different to a horse with uh, short movement, yeah. as you would expect, right? So, Francis Eisenhower? Yes, can you give me more detail on the taking off example of 45 degrees, how to set it and prepare for more energy? Um, if you want to lengthen the stride, you have to gather the hind legs underneath you and flex. Like the more you can compress the hind leg, the more the hind leg will want to push. And whether it pushes up, more up or more forward, is up to your pelvis. It's like after pressing the hind leg into the ground, where is your pelvis going? Is it just going straight up? Or is it going straight forward? Or is it going somewhere in between up and forward? So, yeah, and if you're taking off like from the halt, you, you need collection at the halt first. You have to, you can influence the horse's balance at the halt with just little steps too. You have to change the horse's balance first and then you can go forward. With that uphill balance, it's it's nearly impossible to take a horse that's at the halt, strung out with the hind legs for getting out behind, and then expect the horse to be able to do an upward transition of its forward, upward, and uphill balance. The you might be able to get there in a few strides, but mm -hmm. you actually probably wouldn't if you knew how to do that you would actually go back and first change the way the horse is at the halt first so you set the horse up for success oh. yeah, the hind legs are the springs that you have to compress in order to be able to get this release mm -hmm. and this push if the, the the springs are not flexed or compressed you know if they're more or less extended then there is no reason and no space for that hind leg to extend even more. So first you have to compress it as much as you can, and then the horse will give a powerful pushback. You know, he will dig his feet and hind legs into the ground and he will push the body forward or up, depending on when that's up to you, where you direct it with your seat. If your seat swings up or if your sweet seat swings more forward or up first and then forward as well. I typically do because I want to maintain the uphill balance in the bigger gates. Mm -hmm. So the horse doesn't just crush and burn and run, you know? Yeah. So depends a little bit on the individual horse. Mm -hmm. Some, you know, have an easier time balancing in the bigger gates and others, they just run. Like the country always said, like a rodent dog, cross an attic floor. <laughs> So on those horses, you need to do a lot of engaging, flexing, and collecting, and then release the energy very much up, because the horse would like to go almost forward downward with this energy. Yeah. So you have to direct it up, and then you compromise on somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. And you catch the horse with your aids every time the horse does go into the boundary. You have a boundary that you find acceptable. And when the horse goes outside of that boundary, you catch the horse with your aids to balance the horse back to the balance that you want the horse to be. So the the seat actually the reins refer the horse back to the seat and the seat refers the horse into the balance, into the high next of the balance. And for the medium and extended trot, I always like to picture a plane and airplane taking off. Yeah. So that you know you engage, you collect as much as you can, and then you just release. And I want to feel the withers come up a little more every stride, so that with every stride you feel the front end come up more and more and more. Every stride is a little bigger than the previous one and bigger and bigger. So it, it builds, it's literally like this airplane lifting the, the front end up, and then it just keeps climbing like that. And I want to, to get that climbing feeling, but round and through the back, not inverted and you know over elevated but uh stretch top or line around like exactly the and, and you can really feel sometimes like the withers come up a little bit more with each stride it's like you're you're starting with a collective trot and then withers come up and the horse opens up the stride gets bigger and then the next stride a little more of that and a little more of that and a little more of that 
And you know, sometimes the horses can only hold this for three or four or five strides, mm -hmm. and then you feel them crash a little bit, and then you need or to also clear. you lose the the rhythm or the tempo because the horse has gone outside of the realm of what they can sustain with the current strength and balance. Yeah, and then you could like bring the hind legs under, mm -hmm. sit, and try again because you could lengthen two or three times across one diagonal or down on both yeah. side, right? So it's you won't be able to do this brilliant uphill extended trot for the entire diagonal. At first. Right. For, yeah, first time you try it. It will be two, three good strides, and then it's like oh. <laughs> everything will kind of yeah. wither a little bit. It's wider, you know, you can feel like, oh, this feels good, this feels good, this feels oh, crap. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know because the horse loses their balance at some point. They learn the, they lose the ability to hold it, sustain it, they lack the strength to to have that power and the balance. That's hard. It's not mm -hmm. so easy for the horse. So at first they can only do it for a few strides, just like if you were doing that I didn't hover a squat, you know, right. you wouldn't hold that for 60 seconds in the first lane. Right. Yeah. So then here Sandy Stanger says I've come to realize that my horse feels more secure and gets less tense when I have my weight in the saddle. Is it then a matter of playing around with the weight to see how much I can like and I see to encourage more collection without her losing that feeling of security and her mind. Oh well. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, we've had young horses, young lipid sons that we started, who got nervous when Shanna started posting. I mean, Shanna was always the first one on because she was light and petite. Mm -hmm. I was big and heavy. <laughs> and I like riding the young horses. Yeah, so I like horses. Shanna was always the first one on the young horses. Mm -hmm. And you know, you learn by the first year of training, you don't sit the trot, you just pause, and then you have a horse that gets nervous and then it doesn't nervous. like them. Posting trot, you know, they they want you to, they want the stability yeah. of the, the sitting trot. And as long as you can sit with enough suppleness to not shut the horse's back down. So, it's okay. Then you have to find, you know, basically the question becomes, well, how do I sit to give the horse that security yeah. and stability, but without suppressing the back, right? That's the tricky thing. And so, so then experiment. And yeah, maybe the neutral swing up, neutral. You know, here and there, maybe try and sit a little. So, with the idea of flexing the hind leg, half holding, and then neutral light, you know, um, spread your weight out over the largest possible area. If you have a young horse, um, the larger the support area, the 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 smaller the pressure on the back, right? In terms of pounds per square inch or kilograms per square centimeter, right? Larger support area, less pressure per, per square inch or square centimeter. Smaller support area, more pressure. It's like if you think of a frozen pond, like sometimes that's a useful analogy, I think. If you have a frozen pond, you don't really know how thick the ice is or if the ice is thin. You don't want to stomp on there with you know all your weight on one foot and heel down and you know. Because then that's the fastest way to break break through the ice and, and die, right? Um, if the ice is thin, you go on your you lie down on your belly, spread your weight out, and then you can crawl very carefully over very thin ice, right? And that's that because your body weight doesn't change. You don't get heavier or or lighter within five minutes, but you can spread your weight out over a large area. Then the number of pounds per square inch or kilograms per square centimeters is low. Which means you're not going to break through the ice. And if your weight is concentrated on a very small area, then many pounds per square inch, many kilograms per square centimeters. And that could be an advantage if you really want to send a hind leg into the ground with a certain force, right? So that he really steps down and flexes so that he can push off again. Then maybe you want to do that. Maybe you want to have all your weight on your seat bones. But if you have a young horse or horse with a fragile back, delicate back, you don't want to do that because he'll just collapse and break into two pieces, you know, underneath you. So find out how many pounds per square inch your horse can handle. How big does your support base have to be so that you're not hurting the back, you know? So, and you can increase and decrease the support base. You know, increase 
uh, or de decrease the support base to give a, a certain weight aid and then increase it again to allow the back to come up again. And you know, so everything could be right, everything could be wrong. It depends on your horse and the situation, what you want to do. Right? So nothing is ever static, nothing ever stays the same. Um, you, constant, you constantly have to monitor the horse ask a question, try something, watch the horse's reaction, then maybe change what you're doing if you don't like the horse's reaction. <clears throat> so it's, it's never black and white, it's, you know, it's never static. It's, once you've found something that works, it will change. So that's why riding you know, takes more than one lifetime and yeah. it'll never get boring. <laughs> because yeah. we'll never master it. <laughs> never stop learning. That's the beauty of it. There's always more to explore, develop, learn, polish. There's different directions to go. It's endless. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful journey. Hmm. Carolyn Dar says, I did the circle, minimize the maximize. I must be spiraling in and out. Mm -hmm. Somehow she fell through my outside leg within a couple of meters. Even though my leg was there, should I have put my leg back instead of on the girls because I was pushing her to the outside? Second time my horse was aware and she did the maximizing correct. Depends on whether the horse uh, escaped with the hind legs to the outside or with the shoulders. If the horse pushed the shoulders out too much, then you would have to rotate yourself more so your belly button is. Yeah. yeah. Turn the pelvis so your belly button points towards the inside of the circle, and then use your outside knee rein to contain the shoulder. If the haunches went out too fast, then point your tailbone a little to the inside of the circle and use your outside leg and rein with the outside leg more back mm -hmm. to contain the outside hind leg. But it, it sounds like the next time you rode it, that the nurse did it correctly. So, you said the horse was more aware, but maybe you were also more aware. Mm -hmm. And you were guarding that more. Yeah. So that's what happens. You know, yeah. horses learn too, but we do too. Even if we're not consciously trying to aid and correct it, yeah. you know, just you're a little bit more aware, so you're a little bit more watchful. You're paying attention now to yeah. that, so you're able to keep it in check before it goes too far out of check. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Always fun. Yes. There's some questions in here. Yeah. Yeah, Alison Schmidt says, How long on average does it take for us to connect the dots for these created spaces and weight aids? Oh, it depends on the horse. Some, some horses get it pretty much in the first ride where you explain it, and then others take a little longer. It depends also on how, how good their body awareness is, um, what the previous training was. Some horses are trained to tune out, they're not pay attention, and they take a long, long time. Horses that don't have a good sense of how many legs they are, where the legs are, and, and so on. And take, take longer. Yeah, their personality too. Mm -hmm. You know, they're also different. Um, some of them are just more sensitive and more tuned in mm -hmm. to people, and some of them are kind of in la la land and um, not that interested in paying attention. So it really depends on each horse. It depends on their journey where they are. It, it, there's no concrete answer to that. It, it's our standard answer, or Thomas' standard answer. <laughs> it depends. Yeah, it, it really does. And there's no, it's not a black and white issue. So there's not a black and white answer. There's always lots of moving parts. It's, a, it's an equation with many variables. Right? Depending on how you fill these variables, you get different results or you know, you're doing different things. That's why everything can be right, everything can be wrong. It always depends on the circumstances. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Turning the arms and the shoulders. So enlarging. If the shoulders go out too much, then turn yourself, think shoulder in, point your belly button towards the inside of the circle, your tailbone towards the outside of the circle. Mm -hmm. Contain the outside shoulder with your outside knee and rein. Then maybe use your inside leg to drive the inside high leg more underneath, you know. So it's a classic inside leg to outside brain kind of a deal, but with a twist. Well, they were really a twist of your body. That's so funny sometimes. So, yeah, so, so, yeah, that's what I would do. And if that doesn't help, flex the horse to the outside. So you're essentially creating a bit of a long position. 
you know, so shoulders a little to the inside, haunches a little to the outside, change the bend to the outside, and then you know, the horse has this slight rambert, punches out kind of position, and then that takes care of it. If he goes there, some horses will then try to double down and really lean out with the shoulders, and then you may have to stop and move the shoulder in 90 degrees, and even maybe four parts. That's something I used to do a lot when horses were really crooked and really insisting on pushing through my outside aids. Stop. Quarter period, shoulders towards the, you know, look at the, the center of your circle. Full pass from your outside leg along the circle line. So the hind legs have the large circle, front legs have the small circle. And then I would sometimes quarter period back to my, where I was, or go straight across um, mm -hmm. along the diameter of the circle. And then on the opposite, side of the circle, maybe turn in the same direction. Because sometimes I felt like, you know, everything I created with my stop, quarter pirouette, full pass, I lost again when I did the quarter pirouette back out, you know, sometimes I would lose that shoulder again, so I thought, can't do that. So I go straight across, turn the same direction, and then try again. Is my circle better now? So I was listening more. Mm -hmm. And if yes, good. If no, stop. What a period, full pass, go across. And often it took several repetitions of that until the horses kind of get the message. I mean, exercise. We don't yeah. have any horses that they very so, I did a lot in the panel. I, I don't remember that one in a while. I do a variation of it, yeah. but um, that'd be a fun that was, we were like extremely crooked towards them. I haven't really had one that, that needed that. That's why I haven't done it in, in years. <laughs> A bit of a big gun, you know, there's like subtle, small, you know, exercises, and then there are the really big guns where you're really rubbing it in the horse's nose and say, Hey, you need to listen to the same, you need to move over there. And then from the big gun, you can go back to being subtle and say, Okay, now remember this, you know, remember, you know. Our topic in September for Red Rise is gentleness versus discipline. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's there, especially this week. Carolyn says, yeah. My horse finds full pass hard to move because of that. I wouldn't. <laughs> Sometimes you can explain a subtle movement by doing an exaggerated big movement. It's a really useful tool. Yeah. If, if the horse gets really upset in doing the full pass because they don't understand it, it's hard for them, you can. Blur the lines a little bit at first. You can make it a little allow a little sloppiness, mm -hmm. so the the horse has a, a few more outs, and you're not really kind of pinning the horse down. Mm -hmm. You get the you get the, the mm -hmm. chair, right? Um, they you kind of allow a little crookedness in it and stuff, so the horse gets the general idea, and the horse can build some confidence. And gradually, then you, you make it better and better. You get the horse straighter, less falling through the shoulder, less lingering of the hind legs, less you know inverting. All of these things that can happen in the full pass. Don't avoid it. Um, it's a good tool. Horses are like people, right? You know that you know. There are people who just don't get a hint, right? You you try to be subtle and hint at certain things, and people are completely oblivious. Goes right over the head. Is like you know. I love flowers. I really like flowers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and they will never get it unless you really. Come with a plan. He's actually good about that. And <laughs> of course, you have to say that. In front of an audience. I'm never going to get flowers now. Yeah. <laughs> but um, with a horse, sometimes you give subtle aids, fine riding, invisible, all these great ideals that you have, and and also delicate, you know. And the horse is completely oblivious, ignores you, has no idea what you're talking about. He doesn't even realize you're talking with him. And then sometimes you have to say, "Hey, excuse you, stop." I was asking you to move your shoulder over there. And if the horse doesn't get the hint of, could you move your shoulder one centimeter to the inside and it's, you know, clueless, then you, you may have to say, stop, over here, 90 degrees, and then move a little more. Kind of thing in yeah. head, to be really clear. It's about being really, really clear about saying, wait, no, 
That's not what I'm saying. It's not about beating the horse up. It's not about being angry by no stretch. You don't want to bring that into it. Yeah. It's about being clear and saying, wait, this is not what I want. It's basically like having good boundaries yeah. in, in any relationship. Wait a second. That's not it's, 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 hey, it's not what I need. Pay attention. Yeah. I'm asking you to move the shoulder over here. Yes. And if you don't get the concept of one centimeter, maybe you get the concept of 90 degrees. And then the whole thing, oh, you want me to move my shoulder over here. Why didn't you say so? And then the next time you can try subtle, small, and then usually it goes better. And then maybe you have to do this, the big thing, a couple of times, and then the horse knows. And then you give your subtle aid and you can ask the horse, well, do you remember that? Turn on the haunches, fall back. I remember yeah. this. Mm -hmm. And then they'll do it. So it's, it's, it's really just a correction. It's an explanation. And then you don't need it anymore. Yeah. You know, so, um, but yeah, sometimes you can really feel the horses being completely clueless, oblivious. They have no idea what you're talking about. They have no idea that you were talking to them. Or it's just yeah. easier for them to ignore you yeah. than to comply. Yeah. So they choose the lesser. They would rather ignore you and... <laughs> Deal with the wrath of you up there, be, you know, being unhappy because you're being ignored, then actually go through the physical effort of having to contain that shoulder or whatever it is that they're bulging through, for example, in that case, you know, or the typical one is you want to turn down the center line and you go to turn in the horse drips over the outside gates. That's where it's good to halt. That's back to where you want to be, full pass all the way back to where you want to be. And it, it's a way of very carefully explaining, no, these A's mean something, pay attention. Yep. And it, it both corrects the horse and explains to the horse at the same time. That's, yep. and the horse will get it, they understand. And it's just like with us sometimes where we didn't realize that we needed a higher level of precision and attentiveness and focus until our teacher really rubs her nose in it. And it's like, oh, I have to be that much more precise. And then once you realize, oh, the margins of error are so much smaller than I thought, <laughs> then you can do it. And then suddenly the horse improves, right? And for the horse, it's the same. The horse sometimes just didn't realize that there is that level of precision that's yeah. even possible. Right? So you have to explain it to them. It's like, okay, this is what I want. And you can do it, you know, and then they will, you know, and sometimes it's really just a matter of explaining it to them. And sometimes you have to explain it to them like they're a five-year-old kid, right? So, <laughs> so very clear, very simple, very black and white. Okay, I want you, when I do this, I want you to move over here. And as soon as they, they get it, they'll do it. And then, you know, it's not that big of a deal. Um, and yeah, and in the case of the horse that decides that they would rather, you know, they, they kind of know what you want, but they ignore you because it's easier for them. They need to understand that this correction happens. And the correction, even though it, it's not mean, it should not be punishing. It's a correction that helps to explain. Yeah. But in the end, just listening and paying attention to those aids is actually easier for the horse and they figure that out that that horse that figures it's easier to ignore you if the consequences are not that significant will then pay attention and comply and make an effort to turn and respect your aids and turn when you want to because they learn that that correction happens and it's easier to turn than, than to do the correction and uh, the horses that are smart and they you know, you give the aid and they know what you want and they think that it sounds like a lot more work. Let's not panic quite yet. Let's see if she really needs it. Exactly. So they sort of, let's yeah. wait and see. Yeah. And, you know, and, and if you give up at that point, they say, okay, I guess she didn't mean it. It wasn't serious. Yeah. And then, but if you say, no, I really want you to do this. And then it's like, okay, fine. I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> Horses are funny. They have such funny personality. I mean, Horses are only human too, right? I mean, they, they try to expend the least amount of energy they can usually. And then there are the overachievers and the panickers. So you mean, oh my God, it's like, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. like some people always panic, right? And right. some horses always panic. And then there are those that are like, well, let's not get excited quite yet. Let's, let's see how serious the situation really is. Yeah. And I prefer that because those are the ones that won't kill themselves. Those are the same ones that... <laughs> Let's see how much energy I really need to expend to get through this, you know? And 
they're always grounded in reality and sane and you know and and, and you can, can tell that you know, they mean it and they say okay fine I'll do it. You know? <laughs> but they won't overreact and it's they won't yeah exactly it's my kind of words and the, the other ones they can kill you because they freak out they panic it's like oh my god the world is ending chicken little you know that, that sort of thing <laughs> I write a lot of those kind of yeah. <laughs> like the hot citizen wars. Yeah, I don't know the patience for those. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'd rather wake them up than them yeah. holding hands all the time. But that's yeah. it's just me. But I, I grew up with lazy horses, like these glorified agricultural horses, <laughs> heavy wanderers in the 70s and 80s. Uh, there, were no, there were no injury, there were no thoroughbreds, there were no hot horses, there were hardly any Arabs. There were, most of the horses were lazy. Well, we think of warm bloods as being yeah. really nice, right? Yeah. But they weren't all really nice. Yeah, 40 years ago, they were agricultural horses, heavy warm bloods yeah. that had a very low, slow fuse, very slow reaction time, very much wait and see, make me, you know. Um, so the, oh, yeah. <laughs> so there, the skill was really to wake them up and get them to. A temperature where you could do something with them, and I hardly came across any any hot crazy ones. Mm -hmm. You know, other countries <clears throat> were different. Like in the U.S., everybody had thoroughbreds in the thoroughbreds and Arabs. You know, yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's why I, I guess it's my early form formative years were waking up the lazy ones. So I'm good at that. Yeah. Um, and with the the little you know hot crazy ones, I just I don't have the patience. Sometimes like. Really, <laughs> you don't have a chance to do them. <laughs> as long as they are not completely crazy. Yeah. Okay. Um, a question on Facebook from Sean Ireland. Mm -hmm. Hi, one of our horses likes to lean in. What would you advise to correct the balance on to all four legs? It's crooked as a shoe, right? So if the horse leans in, it's usually on the stiffer side. <clears throat> then you have to shift the weight to the outside. Easiest thing to do is enlarge, like write a circle, enlarge. So you basically, you want to think of bringing the, the horse from the inside aids to, to shift the balance to the outside pair of legs. And you can swing your pelvis more to the outside. You can step into the outside, stir up outside, front, rear, front, rear, and lodge. And then you could step into the outside, stir up in the outside, hind is down, you see inside rain. To half fold into the outside hind, transfer the weight of the inside shoulder into the outside hind. And then also you can come with not all of this at once. Yeah. It's a combination of things. Yeah, you can do any yeah. one of those, and you can combine two or three or four. You know, it's very and creative. Also using your leg, so the thigh and the knee can really guard that inside shoulder with the thigh. I use a lot of thigh when I ride, so to see. And it's not a gripping thigh, but the, I aid with the thighs. It's a very careful precision yeah. of the horse's ribcage. So you can use the inside upper leg, the thigh, to kind of bring the horse back over. You can use the lower leg to drive the inside hind leg and engage it again. Because if the horse is leaning on the right shoulder, let's say, yeah, on the right rein, the horse is, I think it was the right rein now. Yeah. So, yeah. So let's say the horse is, this is on the right. So the horse is leaning on the right shoulder. That means the right hind leg is not doing its job. It's not coming under. There's no bend because the horse is not coming under. So you have to do all these things. You have to talk to all of these different areas and we don't do it all in one stride, mm -hmm. but we do talk to all of these things. We talk to all of the aspects that influence the horse's balance with all of our aids. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, uh, if the shoulder falls in, especially, you could, like, what basic building on Shana said, mm -hmm. use your inside knee and rein, move the shoulder out, make a little room with your outside rein, like, create space, send energy from your inside knee and rein, so the shoulder goes out. And now that the shoulder is out, maybe now you want to drive the inside hind leg forward, maybe sit on the outside seat on for a moment, drive the inside hind with your inside leg forward. And when you feel like it's arrived, sit on the inside line, now flex it, right? So different ways, like step, step, step in the outside stirrup and large. That's the first thing I do. It's the easiest thing. It's usually effective. But you could also just move the shoulder out 
and then sit on the outside hind, and then drive the inside hind forward, and then sit on the inside. So there's different ways you can go about it. And, and one of them will, will definitely work. Maybe all of them will work. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. And so the standard approaches of things that I would do first because they're usually effective. You know, Leslie Wolf says, my horse has a weak right hind leg. Um, we're getting a lovely bouncy part of now, but we show the he on the right. He struggles to name straightness to must be something else, something straightness. So I'm doing counter shoulder on the left brain. It really is. Yeah. So weak right. Um, and yeah. on the right struggles. You may probably to maintain straightness. Yeah. yeah. When people say weak right hind, it, I always wonder is that really the weak, the hollow side where the muscles are smaller? Or is it the stiff side where the hind leg is bracing more and pushing more and not flexing enough? Yeah. Because sometimes, sometimes people refer to the stiff, inflexible hind leg as the weak one, although that's actually the stronger one. Yeah. Um, so let me see. So he doesn't say straight. Right hind doing counter shoulder on the left. So you're riding shoulder in right going. Left. The counter shoulder is a very useful exercise yes, in both directions. You could even go in right, you could do counter shoulder, and then maybe from the counter shoulder on the right rein, you bring the left hind leg under you, sit on the right a little bit, rotate the horse into a slight armbar position, now sit on the left hind, now change the bend, and now you're in shoulder in right. Mm -hmm. So you circumvent the issue, you get to the shoulder and right you want to. Kind of in a roundabout way by developing incrementally from what he can do mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. to going to what he struggles. Yeah, exactly. And shoulder in is much easier than long end usually. So you take the horse on this journey, like the shoulder in left may be easy for him. So you're going right rein, shoulder in left, and he feels like, okay, I can do it. this, is not, not a big deal. <clears throat> then you turn him, now he's in a long bear position. It's like, oh, this is more, too much work, right? And then you say, okay. So you keep you can... the bend. You're just changing it from a counter shoulder in to a rubber. Exactly. Yeah. And then in the arm bear, you're changing the bend. You keep the haunches out, you keep the shoulders in, change the bend. To shoulder. And then the horse will probably feel, oh, thank God. Yeah. This is so much easier. Right? Especially if you ride the rubber for yeah. just a little bit, so, you know. And then you just struggle with it. Yeah. And you could ride a bolt. And start over. Counter shoulder in three strides, on there three strides, shoulder in a few strides, walk and right. So you're kind of moving the horse around, like going right, you know, move the croup to the inside, move the croup to the outside, move the shoulder to the inside, change the bend, turn the shoulder, walk. And so you never stay in any one place very long. So the muscles don't fatigue, the muscles don't hurt. Yeah. The horse doesn't get a chance to dig in and push against you. You don't get a chance to really lock up and push against the horse. So everything is always moving, flowing. So, you know, and then the suppleness of the horse increases, suppleness of the rider increases, and then eventually they can do it. So the shoulder in and walk, that's good. Shoulder in and walk is a good start. Of course, you could do shoulder in right at the walk and then ask for truck transition. That's what I was just gonna yeah. say. That's what I would do. I would take where the person is good, and try to bring that into what you're working on. Transitions within that or with yeah. super guys. Super good. Yeah. Um, yeah, walk hold, walk trot, trot hold, walk camper transitions in, in lateral movements are super mm -hmm. um, effective. Yeah, I like I like to do those a lot. Okay. Okay. Sandra Norster. Yes, it worked for me too, and I could really feel the hind legs come under me, but I find it more difficult than that. Or I think that was about the seat creating space. Yeah. If I move my body sideways, the horse moves sideways, but loses bend. What's going on? If he loses bend, maybe he's supporting himself with the wrong leg. Like if you're short, riding a shoulder in and he's losing the bend, he's probably leaning on the inside front and not supporting himself enough with the outside leg. So you could step out, shoulder in, outside. Stir up front, rear front, and gauge with the inside leg, and let your pelvis 
swing a little more to the other side. Also, if you find that you can get this nice bouncy back movement and swing of the horse's back, but you lose it when you go into the lateral movements, I would try micro dosing your mm -hmm. lateral movements. Go from where it's really good and try adding just 1% of your lateral movement. Yeah. And then 2% and try to find where the horse loses it and then go just under that and stay yeah. there for a bit. And then incrementally getting to where you develop the horse to, mm -hmm. to be able to work. What's happening oftentimes is that riders ask for too much angle and the mm -hmm. person's not ready for. So the horse actually braces the rib cage in the process of trying to figure out how to do the lateral movement. And then the bracing of the rib cage causes this tightening of the back. Yeah, the other thing, when, you, when you're riding single track, everything's going well, then you start a lateral movement, things fall apart. What are you focusing on? Are you focusing on the lateral movement? Or are you focusing on the gate? What's your priority? Yeah, these two work hand in hand. Yes, yeah. so I mean, I, I made the mistake that you know I was riding my walk or trot or whatever, and then shoulder in came up or something, and I was so focused on riding the shoulder in that I forgot to ride the walk or the trot, mm -hmm. and then I screwed it all up. Yeah. And I think my old teacher actually pointed that out. It's like you know, you you ride a walk or trot or canter. That's your priority. Best quality walk, trot, or can you can ride. And while you're at it, ask the horse to move his shoulders a little bit this way or the haunches a little bit that way. So if your priority is to riding the very best quality walk, trot, or canter, and then as an afterthought, oh, by the way, could you move your butt a little over here or could you move your shoulders a little over there? How, can, how much can right. we move the shoulders yeah. over and still keep this nice yeah. movement? You know, this nice suppleness. Yeah. And that's how I write it now. Yeah. For me, the gate is the priority. The movement is not a big deal. The movement is supported. It's like, you know, when you when I was younger and I wasn't, you know, very advanced, that lateral movements were a big deal. It's, oh my God, I'm riding shoulder in. I'm riding half fast. Oh, you know. Yeah. 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 I know it's shoulders. <laughs> Yeah, and so it messes with your brain sometimes. Yeah. Like you have like a false respect for movements, or they're intimidating. Mm -hmm. the, but the, really, the, the important thing is the gait, right? And within the gait, there should be variability. You know, in many ways, variability in terms of stride length, longer strides, shorter strides. Also, in terms of the frame, more up, more down, right? More uphill and collected, more forward, downward. And flexibility or you know variability in terms of um, single track, the shoulders to the inside, shoulders to the outside, haunches to the inside, haunches to the outside. All these things should be possible, right? With, you should be able to move the shoulders a couple of centimeters left or right. Should be able to move the haunches to a couple of centimeters left or right. And don't think of it in terms of oh, in a competition of the thirty three degrees and. That's way too much stress, way too much pressure, right? Just can I move a little bit? Can I move the shoulders just a little bit? You know, this much. And if that feels good, well, can I move a little more? Two more centimeters and two more. Mm -hmm. And eventually you're there, right? Oh, this is like in the competition, you know, but it build it incrementally. Oh, you know, so what Mikolka always said, well, we don't have to give it a name yet because otherwise it was so. I don't know, nailed down, and then it has to be like this, and it has to, you know, otherwise it's not it, right? So I don't call it anything, just I'm trotting along, you know, I want to make, want the horse to feel soft and round and light and all the other good things. You can just bring the shoulder out there. Oh, exactly. And then you can, yeah. yeah. And then from planting the seed, you can then make it a little more and make it a little more. Hopefully the quality will get lost. If the quality gets lost, Leave the lateral movement, maybe by the voltage or something, restore the gate, and when you have the gate back, try again. Right? So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so it's, it's like a game you play with a horse, and it's the priority is always purity of the gates, rhythm, tempo, stride length, impulsion, you know, or the, the energy level, and from there, 
you derive the balance, the straightness, the softness, the roundness, the throughness. And then, you know, when you have those, then you can play with moving hips and shoulders around and, and that kind of thing. And as soon as you lose some of the basics, abandon your, your movement and go back to the basics and restore the purity of the gait. And, you know, so you go round and round. And the horse improves as a, as a result. And then you know, your lateral movements improve. As a result, All right. Terry, Tristan, yes, mm -hmm. I too have really found that your concepts of energy are really helpful. Very helpful in getting the horse really carrying you and balancing itself. There's a lot of feel, which takes so much experience to really get. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad that it works for you. It's uh, uh, it's been forever. It's taken me forever to get that. It seems like such a simple concept, but it's taken me what 45 years now. Um, you're not that old. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and still, I feel like I'm just scratching the surface. There's more. Yeah. Right? So whatever I'm explaining to you, I feel like there's more behind that. There's it's bigger than that. It's it's more, but you know, I still have to do more research to really fully <laughs> understand. We're scientists constantly researching. That's everybody. It's more research. Okay. Maybe. Yeah, he says getting the timing right to not just ask Lucy for a specific movement, but also to make room for it to occur was the single most important change to my writing. So great improvement. Yep, yeah, it was literally like releasing a handbrake. I didn't know I had. <laughs> Welcome to the club. Yeah. Same for all of us. Everybody goes through that, I think. Oh, I mean, he says Tota was the catalyst for that. Lucy, thanks you. Oh. Okay. Yeah, well, you have no idea how long this took me to get. Um, hopefully, I can save all of you a couple of decades <laughs> of frustration. Save you frustration, save your horses' and, frustration. Uh, bending your head against the wall. Yeah, uh, save the fights that happen, you know, when the rider is asking for something, the horse is not doing it, the rider gets angry, upset, you know, the horse gets upset because that, you know, my rider is upset, and this is causes this huge miscommunication. All we have to do is uh, go back to square one and refine the communication. Yeah. And this is stuff that nobody told me. This is something I had to find out by trial and error. Or Mostly we, error. <laughs> or we, we, we got some of it from our teachers, but in bits and pieces. Nobody laid it out like we lay it out. Yeah. We had to get little bits here and there from various teachers that say this and we put it together. Like that, that, that. You know, the Oracle of Delphi, right? <laughs> Very mysterious, very veiled, very little bit here, a little piece there, and then you have to somehow make sense of it all. Right? And I'm sure my my teachers got it on a physical, intuitive level. They were able to do it. They wrote that way, but they because they were talented, they never really analyzed it. They never thought about it a whole lot. They just knew that this is how it needs to feel, and that's what I'm doing. So they, they couldn't really explain it very precisely, which is why I had to fill in the blanks and, and do all the legwork and figure it out on my own, basically. And if that helps other people shave a couple of decades off of their learning journey, I'm very happy. <laughs> Maybe about the time, yeah, you're done with your writing, will be further than you know. Hmm? That's, that'd be a wonderful thing. Yeah, and then if you, process and digest and you can explain it better than I can. Yeah. Maybe you, can you teach some other people and help that's other people. That's the that's the ultimate goal. So we supposed to work right writers lives better and we make horses lives better. And it's, yeah that's really what we want. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay so Carolyn about the full pass. I'll try a gentle tap with a whip when I have somebody help me. She did the full pass a couple of times. Yeah. Are you saying that she's gentle? Not necessarily. I don't know. I have no idea. But uh, I, I know from teaching a lot of people that that is something that can happen. And Carolyn says you can do a full pass everywhere, right? Yeah. Yeah. In theory, yeah, you should be able to. Not get into a wall. You can't, you know, right. if you're. Hope if you halt along the wall, you can't full pass into the wall, you can full pass away from it. There's you know, you don't want to full pass into another horse and rider, you know, these things. Of course, these are obvious things, but really, you can intersperse the full pass anywhere. And sometimes, you know, you have to stretch the 
comfort zone a little bit and tell the horse, you can do it. I have confidence in you. Yeah. Just move your weight. You know, tell the horse, come on, we'll go over there now. And you indicate right. it with your weight. And then maybe your leg and your reins and tell the horse, come with me. Right. Step under my weight. You know, bring you your legs to say move away, then say sub, say come here. And initially you're just asking for one or two steps sideways and you reward the horse and go on. And they can be sloppy. They don't have to be perfect. You're asking for the horse to make an effort. And then later, once the horse is making that effort and understands that that's what you want, then you can start to find and say, Yeah, I can move sideways, but you can be a little less pushing through the shoulder. You know, and maybe a few more steps, and maybe let's bring this hind leg under a little bit more too. So you can start to talk to the little parts, all the different little parts, and refine what it is that you want. So this is how it's shape. You start to polish it a bit. Then, but first, you just want to get the horse to try and to realize that your request is not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. So, and sometimes at first, they'll they really think that that is impossible. What you're asking me to do, you're crazy, lady. You know, and you have to find a way to convey to the horse that this is within the realm of possibility and it's not that horrible. And I'm not going to, you, you really want to be careful not to get too picky about it right at the beginning right. because you want to build that self confidence with the horse. Right. And then once they can do a couple steps, then you can start to say, Good boy, now let's let's do this just a little bit differently. And you don't change everything all at once. You start to change this. Then you add this and then this and then this. And then be pretty soon you have a really nice forecast that is really biomechanically useful in the training. Yeah, the, the big issue usually is shifting the weight to, to the side of the body where the horse never supports himself. Because they're convinced that they're going to die. The legs are going to snap mm -hmm. off. You're trying to kill them. It's that because they're prey animals, right? And if the prey animal loses balance and falls, that could be death, right? Because then some leopard yeah. might pounce down on them and leave them, right? And and it's it's really that life and death kind of yeah. thinking that the horses have. Yeah. And so yeah, try to show him that you can move your weight over here. You have four good legs, one at each corner. They're all perfectly capable of holding you up. You don't need to worry about that. And if, if the horse doesn't, and sometimes they don't trust it, right? It's like, no, I know it's going to break off. I know I'm going to fall. I know I'm going to die. But then maybe do it on the ground. I maybe do the famous, yeah. pelvic horse, rocking, very gentle, like a, a, a millimeter left and right without the rider's weight. And then they feel like, oh, there's a leg over here that I didn't know about. There's a leg over here I didn't know about. And then they were like, oh, I can do that. And it's not hurting, and I'm not falling down, and nothing is breaking. And, you know, and then they expand the horizon, and then eventually they can do it with you on their back. It starts with handling the horse on the ground. When you're grooming the horse, you ask the horse to move over, it might but not be a full pass, but it is the beginning skills needed for that. Mm -hmm. The horse is shifting the weight, has to move some legs from one place over to the other place. Mm -hmm. That is that is already building the skills. You then take that from a comfortable place where the horse trusts you and is familiar with it. You do that in stall. And then you take the horse into the arena on the ground. Mm -hmm. You do the same thing. So the horse starts to understand and you praise the horse a whole lot mm -hmm. because they need to, to build that self-confidence in themselves too. This is really important. And then you can then take this under saddle too. Sometimes horses will totally freeze and become a statue when you ask them to move sideways. And that's when it can be useful to have, to either get off and do it on the ground or to have somebody to assist you from the ground, you know, that can come and remind the horse, this is how we move sideways. Be perfect, just make an effort, you know? Yeah. And yeah, don't avoid it. It's a really useful tool. Yeah. <clears throat> you have to sometimes build a ladder or smaller extent. Yes, you have to not just sometimes, always. Yeah. And a lot of people think you know that you just suddenly do something. You don't. You have to build all the prerequisite skills along the way. Yeah, with a full pass specifically, you may have to allow the horse to go forward a little bit more first. So it's more like a leg yield, more diagonal, and then it becomes more sideways, less forward. Yeah. Um, doesn't matter if the head goes up, doesn't matter if all these things you just want yeah. the horse to just shift the weight and move sideways mm -hmm. in some fashion. 
Yeah. And you reward the horse profusely, and you know, and and go away from it, and then come back to it and say, "Try again," you know. Mm -hmm. you tell people saying, "I feel I've been mostly trained like a soldier, but it's no ability to think and make adjustments." That yeah, you that's a lot of people. Yeah, me too. In the early years, I was just the way it was, right? Yeah, and in fact, Pretty, that's literally the way it was when I was young. Writing yes. teachers always gave us the feeling that you're hopeless, you have no talent, you'll never be as good as I am. Yeah. And they always reinforced was, that that belief that we're nothing, we're untalented, we're worthless, we will we will never get there, we will never amount to anything. That was the writing school culture in Germany at the time. Luckily, I didn't have to experience any of that. I'm really grateful that I didn't get that. Um, it, it's yeah. nasty and shaming and yeah. blaming it, humiliation, and just nastiness, you know, and uh, it's amazing that anybody stays with it. Basically, <laughs> it's like the filter, the people that really, really want to stay in it, and everyone just gives up. Like we torture ourselves. <laughs> well, there's that too. <laughs> it's a different topic. <laughs> right. But yeah, I mean, most people in Brahma, they're yeah. the really crazy ones survive, right? And they, it's like with baggage, they survive with, with baggage. baggage. It yeah. feels traumatizing on, on yeah. some level. And, but I know I wanted it so badly that I thought, well, screw it, I'll prove everybody wrong. Everybody who laughs at me and everybody who says I will never learn to write, I'll prove them wrong. I'll do it. Let if it kills me, it. I will do it. I will know? prove it. But that's a little yeah. unhealthy, maybe too. But I don't know. Yeah, that's how I was. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Why do you like each other? Yeah. But insane in the same way. <laughs> same way. Yeah. Anyway, so let's also should I say doing everything in front until it becomes easy before attempting camera? Oh yeah. <laughs> Usually um, that's what I do. I mean, you don't have to do everything. Get everything you see in the trot before attempting camera depends on the horse. Um, Usually, yeah. it makes sense to establish balance in the slower gait, and when that feels easy, mm -hmm. go up one gait. But there are exceptions, of course, yeah. as always. Mm -hmm. There are horses that find lateral movements in the trot easier than at the walk. In the walk, they sort of stumble along and they trip over their own feet. As soon as you get into the trot, mm -hmm. yeah, they're zooming along. And it's, mm -hmm. and I don't know, works, it's easier for them. So with them, you know, you go into the trot and do it at the trot first, and then maybe come back to the trot later, to the walk later. There are horses that have a much better canter than trot. Mm -hmm. So, so with them, you might find trot, uh, cantering early is actually good mm -hmm. because they balance better. Not necessarily the doing the lateral movements yeah. in the canter, but the canter will actually, with those horses, yeah. help you with your trot work. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it depends. Yeah, you can. To find out what kind of a horse you have. Maybe 80% of the horses are like that. Start at the walk, where it feels easier to walk, go to the trot, where it's easier to trot, go to the canter. 20% maybe or 10% are oh, different. The rule writers. For whatever reason. Yeah. You find out, right? You can always say, well, I'm just going to try it. It doesn't hurt to ask, right? Yeah. And either it works or it doesn't. If it works, great, we'll do it. If it doesn't work, then never mind. Sorry, horse. Go back to the easy thing, to the lower gate, and so on. But sometimes there are surprises. Sometimes there are surprises. Yeah. Usually the horse that has a good canter that will help improve the quality of your trot work will offer the canter. Mm -hmm. They find the canter easier, so they're going to offer it when the trot work gets harder and say, oh, you just do this at the canter. You know, can't just do this at the canter. And then doing the actual thing at the canter might be too hard for them, but cantering them will bring them the through this, the back movement, the impulsion, all the things that they needed to get back. Mm -hmm. And then you can come back, you can canter like a circle or around the arena or something, mm -hmm. and then come back to the trot and take all of that goodness you got from the canter and bring it back into your work in the trot. Yeah. There's also this general principle that you go from simple to complex, from easy to difficult, mm -hmm. and you only move. To the next stage, more difficult stage when the easy stage is confirmed. But there's also the inverse relationship. You can jump up one level, do something more difficult that teaches the horse additional skills and awareness, and then you come 
back to the easier stage and it's better. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the more difficult, more advanced work will improve the more basic work yeah. within limits, right? You, you know, so, but it's a thing. <laughs> it it, it yeah. really works sometimes, like especially when you're doing that chopping wood, carrying water, and you feel like I'm stuck, it's not going anywhere. You can sometimes go up one level with something more difficult and then come back to the easy work and it's better. I have a good yeah. one. Yes. Oftentimes the PF work improves the basic canner. Right. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. All the time. Passage and post the truck. Yeah, mm -hmm. the post the canner. So starting half steps, for example, will potentially improve the horse's but balance in the candle. Part. Does it necessarily mean you go do this with every horse? But some horses, yeah. that's going to be a key. Yeah. And when you ride some lateral movements on the circle, suddenly your circle on a single track will be better. Of course it is, because the lateral movements have a function to make the horse more through and straighter and all of these things. And things. adjustable. You know? And adjustable, so it makes the quality of your normal single track or canter, whatever it is that you're doing, much better. Yeah, aligning the horses, hips and shoulders on the line of travel is a lot easier after you've done some lateral movements because lateral movements just means you're keeping the hips on the line, you're moving the shoulders away. You're keeping the shoulders on the line, you're moving the hips away mm -hmm. to the inside, to the outside. And when you've played with that a little bit, then the horse is a lot more aware of the line, the hips, the shoulders, your aids. And then riding in a slightly simple circle on a single track suddenly seems easy, you know, because the horse now has more body awareness, more awareness of your aids. So more advanced things can make the basic things better, you know. So it's not just linear from simple to complex and from easy to difficult, but sometimes it works the other way around too, within limits. Okay. okay well, um, I, didn't you read that one from Carolyn? I didn't read that at all. Actually. Okay. Carolyn was saying, I was thinking that I was doing it wrong. She's very smart. Maybe that's better that. that. Don't remember now what it refers to. But yeah, yeah, I mean, know, so yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think it's the one that works. Yeah. Did you read this one from Terry? Um, oh, no, not yet. Yeah. yeah, Terry says, I found that the full pass on going. To the left, it's quite a bit more difficult. The little he likes to keep his right height in most of the time. So being straight in the four passes channel. So this has been a great thing to work on with him. He's gotten better each day on both sides. There you go. Just you know, keep chipping away. Good. Good. And uh, yeah, and, and observe. Yeah, as long as the horse is getting better, you know, it seems to have a positive effect on the horse. Kelly Dara says, I think I have to kick her butt and wake her up and negotiate my ride with her. I not kick her butt, but to remind her um, that she has certain obligations that it, it's yeah. worthwhile to fulfill. <laughs> Sometimes you have to wake them up a little bit and not, increase the energy level. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I wouldn't say uh, kick her butt, you know. <laughs> We don't want to have that kind of antagonistic attitude in any, any major relationship. I'm sure, he doesn't mean anything. Okay, that. but I just think yeah. verifies for anybody who's not used to our method. You know, you don't really want this into an antagonist relationship. But so we try to set things up so that um, uh, we can be the nice guy. It's the work that the horse makes the work hard on their own, <laughs> and we show the horse the easy way out. Mm -hmm. You can do it that way, it's really nice. Yeah, that's a strategy too. Like, you know, the horse tries to avoid work, comes up with an evasion. You can take the you can take the evasion and make it more work, and then the horse realizes that was a mistake. That mm -hmm. turned out to be way harder than what the writer asked me to do. Oh, you want to do that? Okay, you want to care so much? Oh. And if that happens enough time, the horse will come to the conclusion that whatever the rider is asking me to do is the easiest thing to do under the circumstances, even if it feels hard. And then they will stop looking for evasions, for easier alternatives. They will just do what you're asking. They'll try to find a way to do yeah. what you're asking. But if you do that, if you take the evasion and make, make them do it correctly, 
um, you don't correct them, you don't tell them they made a mistake. It's like, oh, good, you want to do this in the canvas. So, do this in the canvas. Let's do it, but I won't make my circles bigger and I won't make, you know, I won't change the line. We'll keep writing the same exercise and please do it correctly. And then the horse will pretty soon think, oh, never mind. Let's go back to the drawing. I liked your idea better. Yeah. <laughs> you know. It's win-win, right? You, you and don't... you can be nice to the horse the whole way through. You're, you're and... saying, oh, what a great idea. We'll do it if we can. Yeah. And then when the horse is going, yeah, I like your idea better. Can we try it? Yeah. yeah, of course, we can try it. And it. there's always a chance that the horse can pull it off, right? You offer the camera, you say, okay, let's do it, but do it right. And then the horse can do it. And you're like, wow. And then... Wow. Cause for celebration, then oh, the horse is more advanced than I had thought of you. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And it happens. It happens sometimes that the horses are actually already ready to do more and you didn't realize it. And then it comes out like this that the horse volunteers something. <clears throat> and then if you if you say, Oh, this actually feels kind of good. I didn't really think he could do that, but if he wants to, never hold, never stop somebody from working, right? If somebody <laughs> wants to work, never hold that. So go ahead. Do it, and then you know if he, if he does it, make a big fuss, make a big deal. Take it as a great suggestion. Yeah, like, I love like this suggestion. Let's play with it. Let's see this goes. And if it really goes well, maybe incorporate it. It's yeah. like, well, maybe he's farther along than I thought. Let's play with this for the next few days. Let's do it again next tomorrow. You know, the next day, and see what goes. Right. Never. And that's often how the best moments happen. That's often mm -hmm. how progress happens. So. The horse shows you he's ready for more. Yeah. And this is mm. when training really becomes collaboration. It's not just top down, you training horse, you horse, you obey me. You know, it's the horse making suggestions and you taking them and saying, let's see what we can do with this. Mm. And maybe it goes well and you go, huh, this is great. Let's, let's follow this great idea, horse. You know, and maybe it doesn't go well. And the horse goes, uh, never mind. I like your idea better. And you're like, okay, let's just go with my idea then. You know, either way. You both win. You both win. Right. Jennifer Holman said, that is my problem of starting out and riding with an eager thoroughbred that needed to be held and released <laughs> for energy. Now I have a lazy thoroughbred that I need to wake up, but I'm scared that they will run off because I'm not holding. I'll give it a try. Wake yeah, him up. You don't he, have to do it all at once. Yeah. Can do it I mean, horses often go from one extreme to the other. Like the, the lazy ones can really open up and then be a little bit too energetic and exuberant. Mm -hmm. So as you ask him to put more work, more effort into the work, be ready to catch him and half halt. Yeah. Um, just like you know, the, the hot, hectic, nervous horse can be relaxed and almost be lazy all of a sudden. So be, be, be ready for that. Training correction, you know, if you have a rehab horse that comes with bad habits and this and that, um, often happens in this pendulum kind of point where you start with the horse making one mistake, you work on it. Now the pendulum goes the other way. Things get better, get better, get better. Oh, he's doing the opposite now. He's making the opposite yeah. mistake. And then you have to change your strategy, fix that. And then he goes again back to the old ways. And then just try to make each swing of the pendulum a little bit smaller than the previous one so he goes big swings and then smaller swings and then eventually he stays sort of in the middle and then maybe just very tiny little oscillations you know and then you can keep your ship in the canal basically and you can keep the horse more or less where you want it to be you know? i would say playing with little things to start to um, wake the horse up in little bits you don't want to suddenly take the whip and start swishing it, you know, like, we, I mean, it's a, something you do with a, a really lazy horse, but this horse might be mass laziness, right? So, or, or masked, the laziness is a mask on the, the, the tension. Well, if he's right? behind the aids and he just mm -hmm. acts like he's lazy, then there is like a volcano. Yeah. What pressure is building, and if you switch the whip, he might fuck you off, yeah. right? So be careful with that. Or go, oh my god, you know, like ah, and freak out. So if you want to do little things to try to wake the horse up. You could do this with exercises that kind of liven the horse a little bit without freaking the horse out because it gives the horse something to do. That's my suggestion. And then incrementally see how much you need. Mm -hmm.
Maria, Maria Bowman says this evening, my Corky Thorbert did a few perfect steps at the facade of that, but then decided that he couldn't possibly do any more. He started to rush backwards, lifting both front back legs, swinging his quarters to the right, etc. I asked him to do facade in the opposite direction for a few steps, then back to the left for some, some steps. We went back and forth a couple of times, and then without any drama, he suddenly happily stepped left around the whole corner. It's funny how trying the opposite can sometimes work. Well, good that that worked out well, right? Um, interesting. I mean, just going back and forth in the passage is harder than just going in one direction. But if you go one way and the horse blocks and then he wants to run backwards and get out of it, yeah, go the, op the opposite way. Most likely he'll be happy because it shifts the weight. And then, like, if you started going left, and then he refused, that probably meant the left hind leg was starting to cramp up or fatigue. So go to the right, the left hind leg gets a break. Now the right hind leg has to start, uh, has to, to start supporting more. And then after a few strides, the left hind leg may have recovered enough that you can go back to the left. So uh, seems like you applied good thinking and um, had a good, good effect on the most. Okay, I want to answer these couple of things and then we need to go because our, our daughter is summoning us to dinner. She's setting the table. Yeah, we need to go. It's very late here. It's 11 o'clock here. So, yeah, we need dinner late. Um, okay, Beth Brown says, I can feel the horse's footfalls at the canter and trot, but walk canter movements. I have difficulty when to get the aid for the canter part so that she has time to pick up the hind leg. When the outside hand is on the ground, the inside hand is lifting up. Mm -hmm. And you have to prepare a little bit. You have to do something to get the weight onto the outside hand and then focus on outside hand touching down, inside hand lifting up. And then when you feel that movement, then you can go half fold into the outside hand, half fold into the outside hand, and up into the kingdom. Initially, sometimes you get so not so perfect transitions, and it's okay as long as you're getting them closer in the direction of what you want and you build the understanding of the horse. The the you, the skills you're building are the physical ability for the horse to do it and the understanding. You need to build both of these together. And uh, choose an exercise that makes the canter inviting. Don't go straight out alongside yeah. enough for the canter. Even walking on a twenty meter circle can be difficult do something lateral movement bolt as something to maneuver the, the weight onto the outside line and then lift up sometimes with some horses it's good to pick up the can on the wall and like you do something to get the hind legs underneath you both of them shift the weight to the outside line and maybe on a wall to ask the horse to Mm -hmm. Pick up the candle, then you, in the candle, you finish the bolt, you go large, or you go big like in the latter half of the voltage. So you use the voltage at least, you know, half to, you know, three quarters of the voltage to really bring the weight to the inside line. And then you pick up the canter and you say, this is great, you know, let's do a 20 meter circle or something. Mm -hmm. Or go around, let it bring up, whatever. Um, just a few more comments. Uh, Caroline Douglas mm -hmm. said, where's the full pass easiest in the corner? Not necessarily. Not um, um, horses like to cling to the wall. If you hold next to a wall, they may not want to leave the wall. It's a really useful thing to do yeah. with a full pass away from the wall. But yeah. yeah. Somewhere on the inside of the arena, like stop on the center line or turn away from the long side and stop somewhere and then ask for a couple of steps of full pass. Mm -hmm. so on the easy. center line can be really good. Maybe do it in hand first yeah. so that you're on the ground. And you just ask the horse, can we move over this way? Can we move over that way? And then get on the horse and repeat it. Because it's already in the mind of your horse at that point. Your horse is already thinking. If you have anybody that can assist you on the ground, then they can come and just be that ground person. They're not even having to do a whole lot. They're just there to support you. Maybe put their hand on the Horses rib cage, maybe if their horse is fine with them, they can, they can use a weight too. They can, you know, put their finger on the rein or the bit rein and help guide the horse to move over a little bit. And then you just reward the horse, just like they did the most amazing, wonderful thing. And, and then you go and do something else, you leave it and go and do something else. You don't keep drilling it, you go away. Yeah. Yeah, if you have support from somebody on the ground, they can make a huge difference. Exactly. And make things easier. 
ground persons like the translator between you and the horse. It doesn't even have to, I mean, it could be um, anybody that's not afraid of a horse. It doesn't even have to be a trainer or anything. They just have to be there as some moral support to the horse and, and to reinforce what you're mm -hmm. doing. Or vice versa, you do it on the ground, you put your friend on the horse, and then you ask the horse to move over with your friend up there. And then do it again with your friend giving the aims, and then then go away and do something else. Just go have a normal ride without touching that, and then come back to it another day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Psychology. Well, then same thanks for the encouragement. Love you guys. Love you. There it is. She must herself as lazy. I want to collaborate with her. So I'm also trying to please her, not bore her to death. We're not riding constantly in the arena. There are a lot of exercises like you walk in the courses, many ideas. Um, I find when I'm riding, I have to get a lot of tools in these. That happens. Yeah, a lot of yeah. people do it. it. It'll stick in your brain after a while. Um, if she holds back, you know, and stores energy behind you, maybe lunging or double lunging could be good. Also, open travel ladies. To see if you can bring her out of her shell, that she shows the energy. Maybe that means she'll buck a couple of times, but then she's safer to ride. If she holds back and you sit on her, she'll suck back more, and then eventually, you know, they, they explode. Yeah. You know, so. Um, you don't want to be on the horse when they explode. Yeah. So That's why we don't like the control. Yeah. Naomi says, as ever, it's been fun hanging out. Time to get up and copy. Yeah. Good morning to you, Naomi. Yeah, time for us to. Yes, and time for us to go to dinner. I have to do a few things before I can eat. So, um, so my chicken's in. <laughs> okay. Okay. We need to quit. Everybody. For tonight. Yes. We are two, two items. The timing of the AIDS course starts on Friday. It is open for enrollment. Jump in the course. We would love to see you in it. We have lots of more discussions like this. We're finding the AIDS, how to apply the AIDS. Oh, it's all about the AIDS, right? This is the AIDS of the glue that holds it all together. Um, if you have any questions, just email us, riverforsage at gmail.com. We're also going to be back tomorrow. Same time, same channel. <laughs> Talking about how to improve the quality of your horse's games. Last time tomorrow, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Tomorrow. yeah. Tomorrow's Thursday, yes. and then we're starts on Friday. Yeah. 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 So um, we're talking about how to improve the quality of your quality of your horse's games with your aids, with the timing of your aids. It's a related discussion to today, but a little bit more just about the quality, how to get that really good quality movement. So meet us here.